Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, today on the show, we're going to be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today on the show, we are honored to be sitting down with Ingersoll, Ontario Deputy Mayor Lindsay Wilson. But before we get into today's interview, I just want to take a moment and ask you to do me a favor. If you can, so kindly, please head over to our Facebook page or Instagram or X page or Twitter as it used to be called and give us a follow. We have behind the scene content that you don't want to miss. And it's it, it gives us a method to get our message out even further. Uh, we started the show to make municipality issues matter. And we really hope that you can join us along that way to make sure that municipal news and issues are heard on a national stage. So with that, Thank you so much. And now on to our interview with Ingersoll, Ontario Deputy Mayor, Lindsay Wilson. Lindsay, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with my first question that I've asked almost every person who's ever come on the show. So you're really no exception to this question. But that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? And I'm looking forward to this answer because I've read a little bit about your backstory and I can't wait to hear what you say. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for having me. And like I said in my email, I've been listening to your episode. So I knew this question was coming. Um, and it's a good one to kind of, you know, revisit from time to time for sure. Um, but I realized my answer is pretty layered, you know, like my, my uh, dad was very active in the union, um, what used to be CAW, now Unifor. And so I really grew up with that sense of like people are entitled to opinion and you can work towards things that are good for the collective. Um, my mom uh, was a nurse. Uh, and so, you know, I really saw that uh, growing up that you could participate and be involved uh, in that way. Um, but later in life, um, a friend of mine ran uh, for council, lost. Uh, and at that time we said we would bring a municipal campaign school to our community something that was really uh, impactful through her campaign. Um, so just recently, uh, a, a couple of years ago, we brought Municipal Campaign School to our community. Um, and so just kind of through that advocacy and activism in our community, uh, here I am. <laughs> okay, so I've got to <laughs> ask, what was it about the allure of municipal politics that drove you to it? Because uh, you talk about your mom and dad being involved in the union, and traditionally unions are more provincial or even federally uh, involved. And I'm not saying all are, I'm just saying that's where they traditionally, I'm not painting a broad stroke there. But what was the allure to municipal politics? Because you talk about your friend getting involved and in running their campaign. Was municipal something that you always paid attention to, or was it something that just came about until your friend ran? Uh, that's a good question. I actually did run provincially uh, in, in this most recent provincial election. Um, and, you know, provincial and municipal are very intricately connected. The issues are very interrelated. Um, and at the end of the day, the allure of municipal politics for me was how close I could be both to the people that I served, but also to the issues that municipal government uh, is in a position to actually change. And I'll use like the easiest example, because I was just there this morning, we had a grand opening for pickleball courts. And, you know, is that life changing? Maybe not, but it does matter to the community. And it's something the community identified as a priority. Uh, council, you know, directed staff to pursue it. And here we are, we have eight pickleball courts. Um, so you, you know, you get to see the people that that mattered to, um, whether it's pickleball courts or, or a different issue. The allure to me was how close you get to be um, on both sides of the, the coin. So in 2022, you you don't just put your name for it once, you put your name for it twice, provincially and then municipally. Right. <laughs> uh, that probably is a busy year for yourself. And I can imagine after an extensive provincial campaign, you're probably tired. But the short turnaround time from that provincial campaign in June and getting elected deputy mayor in October is quick, short turnaround. What made the change? What said, OK, I enjoyed the campaign. 
I still believe my voice is needed somewhere. I'm going to decide to put my name for a council in the town of my community of Ingersoll. Yeah. Um, I really, really wanted to do it. I really wanted to run municipally. But to your point, it is very emotionally draining, physically draining. Uh, I have a young family. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it was a lot to wrap my head around to going through another campaign. But what pushed me uh, to make the decision was the number of people who, who continued to ask me to do it. And that's often what it is for women uh, need to be asked there. No one can, can uh, fact check this, but the, the, um, the myth is that women need to be asked a minimum of seven times before they'll even consider running. And that was, that was exactly the case for me. People kept asking me and not just asking me, but offering their support. And that's the difference too. Like you never want to feel like you're doing it um, on your own or because your, your ego tells you that like you're the one. Um, it really should be about the community supporting you in that effort. And I felt what, supported. So one of the things on this show that I, I, I like to dig get into is the jurisdictional roles that municipalities play in the provincial place. Now, uh, and I, you're, you're a unique guest for me. And I apologize if I ask this inappropriately, but I need, think I need to ask this. You run provincially, you run municipally in the same year at the doors. Did people understand the jurisdictional differences between the provincial government's roles and responsibilities and what, what they are uh, de dedicated to and what the municipalities jurisdictionals are, because I think there's an apathy in this country that I want to try and educate people on. And that's why the mm -hmm. show has come about, about what mm -hmm. the roles are. So for someone who was on the ground and ran in two elections, yeah. did people actually understand the jurisdictional roles and what they were voting on instead of just a blanket slate of, oh, you're running for this party or, okay, you're running. I like you, so I'm going to vote for you. Yeah. That's a tough question. I would say... Like the easy answer in general is no. Yeah. And and my um, it's 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 hard to answer the question because partly is like voters don't necessarily even care whose job it is to get something done. Um, and should they? they? I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer for that yet. They just want to know that it's that someone <laughs> ha has it on their agenda, right? Um, and so I didn't. The, the answer that always bothered me before I was elected is, well, actually, that's the provincial government. Well, actually, that's the county, because that is, a, and that's true, but that's also a very easy answer to not have to, to take any responsibility for really challenging issues. So the, the short answer is no, people don't always know the difference, but, you know, would it be great if they did? Of course. But at the end of the day, what they really want <laughs> is to know that, you know, someone's someone's listening. So I would often, you know, explain the difference. You know, that's a federal issue. Uh, if I'm running municipally, I can't necessarily directly address it. Um, but municipal councillors can can, you know, throw their weight around in terms of advocacy in a way that a resident can't. So it's still important to know what their concerns are and what's on their radar. So we're coming up to one year in office for you. Mm -hmm. October 2022, you first got elected. This air, this episode is airing the first week of October. So I, I want to know from you, has it been what you expected? When you first put your name for it municipally, is this what you expected the life of a municipal politician would be one year, almost one year into the job? Hmm. <laughs> Ask I mean, the tough questions ways, on this show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some ways, yes. You know, um, the, the, the actual uh, tasks that you have to do, be prepared for a meeting, answer your emails, um, you know, all that's pretty much what I expected. I would say the part that surprises me and the part that I, that is a focus for me um, it's to your point, like people are just really not engaged. Um, and sometimes they're engaged in the wrong ways. And, and you would really like, like, I do not get a lot of emails. I'll be very honest. I don't get a lot of emails from residents. I get a lot of DMs and I get a lot of, you know, tag me in comments and that's fine. I'm okay with that because I've, um, uh, 
given that tool to to the people that I communicate with. But I, you know, it's better if they send an email because then it's you know documented and I can share it and um, and all of those kinds of things. But I think the part that's surprising to me is how disengaged. Like it, it's very common that there's no one at a council meeting, for example. And it's like, this is your space. This belongs to you. Um, now, so are your can... council meetings live streamed though? Like they are do live people... streamed. Okay. So some people tune in, uh, not a lot. Um, but that just breaks my heart, you know, because this is, uh, you know, that's their council chambers, not mine, not mayors, whatever it is. Um, so that's been the part that's been most surprising to me and where I try to encourage people to participate. I'm going to ask a very fizzle, a, a, a very open question, but I feel like you can answer it. Why do, why do you think people are not engaged? Why do you think people are tuned out into the municipal realm? Because, well, mm -hmm. you probably saw it provincially and federally. Uh, we, I'm not, you didn't run federally, but I ran federally. And I can tell you that people are engaged federally because it's partisanship. And there's the, yeah. the left versus the right, the blues versus the red, or the orange versus the green, where municipally it's everyone in it for them. Everyone's in it for the right reasons for building the community forward. Why do you think people are just not engaged in municipal politics and governance at that matter? Mm -hmm. I think there's two things. I think I really believe that people have not um, appropriately recovered from what we all experienced during the pandemic. We've just kind of like shoved it way, way down. <laughs> uh, we, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to think about it. What we're pandemic are like you that. talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that really wears on on someone's mental health. Um, like I have two kids who were, were at home and um, and I'm always very open with the, with people about this. That was very challenging. And I was lucky enough to have access to counseling through my employer at the time to help me work through how difficult that time was. And that took money and time and effort. Not everybody has the money, the time and the space to um, sort through how challenging that was. So that added to the fact that we are in a really challenging affordability crisis. Like who has time to email their mayor when they're just trying to you know get get by and that is the experience of so many people and so while we wish that that would uh translate into more activism it's it's just it's exhausting and um i think people are feeling uh tired deflated uh you know hungry quite frankly uh, and so I think it's just kind of those things just adding up and, and piling on top of each other and people just kind of the easy thing to do is just get through the day. Now, you bring up a tough uh, conversation that I, I, I enjoy having, but I think it's important to have as well, because you as municipal politicians are the closest to the people. The decisions you make impact the people the next day. Now, you're about to head into budget season, if not mm -hmm. already entered into budget season in your community. You've passed one budget that was imp that was worked on in the previous government, but you still passed it. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you're doing it right for the community? Because the decisions you're making are going to impact people's living, in, uh, impact their pocketbooks. And you talk about the affordability crisis that we're going through in this country right mm -hmm. now. And you play a role in that, in impacting the day-to-day -day lives of people. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you go into the council chambers to make sure that the decisions you make make the least impact on people, but have the biggest impact on people in some yeah. sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say I put, you know, the most amount of responsibility as humanly possible. Um, you know, I ask, I, I think you know, especially being new last year, you know, the budget's new, but also the budget process is new. Every community passes their budget differently. Um, and for me last year, being deputy mayor, one of the roles is obviously to step into a meeting when the mayor is not able to. So I chaired our capital budget meeting. First, first meeting and chairing the capital budget meeting. So not only was I learning 
um, how to represent the residents well through that process, the logistics of, of chairing that meeting. Um, and so I just look at, look at it as, um, you know, studying it, learning something like you would learn anything new, just spending a lot of time uh, with staff, reading about it, learning about it, going back to historical. I mean, the great thing is that meetings were recorded over the over COVID. That's one of the good things that came out of it. So I could go back to previous budget meetings and watch those conversations so that I had the historical understanding of what residents wanted and expected. Um, but it is not easy to balance um, not impacting the residents financially, but also making the investments that are actually going to matter to them. That is such a fine line. And I always make a point to say too, um, I am bringing the perspective of residents, not just the taxpayer, because a lot of our residents uh, are uh, renters, for example or maybe they're living homeless and they still deserve a voice in that conversation too. Um, and that's a balance as well because some people think only the taxpayer gets to have a, a, a an opinion in that conversation. So I always try to make it a point to get as many perspectives as possible throughout that process. But at the end of the day, um, there's only so much money to go around in a municipality. That's that's and, the, and at the uh, end of the day, of how municipal revenue works. And at the end of the day, you have to make the tough choice, right? Mm -hmm. You have to live and die by that choice. Um, you go to the grocery store the day after that choice is made. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you're a year in, you may or may not, but you probably hear from residents about the issues that they face and mm -hmm. whether it be what's going on at council or whether it be just going on in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, how do you balance being a small or a, a municipal uh, politician who doesn't get to go off to Ottawa, doesn't get to go off to Queens Park to do your job? You're in your community each day. Is there respect that comes into the position where you say, okay, I, I make my decision. I vote on the decision that I believe that's best for the community. And if someone asks me my opinion, I have to respectfully give them to them because I, I I'm there to represent them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the the great thing about a small town, um, I think, is, and, you know, people are certainly friendly at the grocery store and, and all that kind of thing. Um, but there's no, uh, like, it, you're also Are not that special, <laughs> oh. which I think is great. Like, it, you know, we're here to do a job and we take that really seriously. Um, but there, sh there shouldn't be, um, you know, I, I don't know how to say it. Um, people like shouldn't be celebrity, like just because you're the deputy mayor, you know, whatever. Um, you wouldn't I have made it well in my hometown because I stopped my regional counselor and my local <laughs> counselor all the time when I yeah, saw them. <laughs> I'm fine with it. Um, but people are very respectful of that. And maybe it's because I'm often out with my kids and people maybe aren't sure um, if I'm if I'm okay with that. So it's not that I mind. Um, and sh certainly people, like I was picking up my daughters at school the other day and someone said, hey, what's that building going up by so-and-so? Um, so it's not that people don't, um, but it's, all you know, there there is a, a, a humble uh, approach, I would say. Have you found the balance? Because uh, in a small town, you you know, and I know, it's not a full time job being a deputy yeah. mayor or being a part uh, a politician, but you you get in, you put in what you want into the job, mm -hmm. and it seems like from what I see on social media and how active you are, you put a lot into the job because you want to do the job correctly. But you know, you're new, relatively young mother who has children and you need to balance the job with the family life. And have you found that balance to be easy to come by? Um, we're getting there. We're getting there. I think what I learned very quickly, um, and I say this to other new counselors too, because it's worked is, um, I, I set the I set dedicated time aside to work on my my council stuff and and I work really hard and I make the time 
But if I if I come upon a free block of time, I don't try to just fill it. You know, like I might uh, go for a walk or, to, you know, make dinner with my husband, whatever it is. If there's a free hour, uh, I try to make sure I, I dedicate that to um, something for myself or something for my family, because the instinct is to fill it with council stuff. Um, but I feel really confident in the time that I've set aside. So if it, an hour frees up, uh, I try not to just, you know, plug it full um, with other stuff. And I think too, residents really respect that, you know, so my oldest daughter plays hockey, for example, that's a, something that our family participates in. Um, so if I can't go to a community event because we're at a hockey tournament, people are okay with that. Um, and, and for a big portion of our residents, that's actually much more relatable to, to the representation they've had in the past. Um, so I'm just honest and open and uh, I've gotten really good at planning and managing my time, you know, to the hour. <laughs> I guess I should have asked this question beforehand, but I, I, I'm going to ask it now before we go into the next subject. And I think it's a good segue. Why did you run for deputy mayor or are you elected like North Bay is and their deputy mayor, Maggie Horsfield, who whoever got the most votes yeah. as counselor becomes deputy mayor? Is that like an Ingersoll or what, so, what made you deputy mayor? <laughs> so actually, uh, I would have won either way, I'll say that, <laughs> if it was either of those. Um, but in Ingersoll, we are directly elected as deputy mayor. Okay. So I didn't run for council and get the mo most, I mean, I did get the most votes, but I didn't run for council. I ran okay. for deputy mayor against one other person. Okay. Um, and so I was directly elected to the position. Okay. I, I feel like I should have known that, but I, I, I try not <laughs> to do a everywhere. lot of research because I, my guests won't know that I did that research, but anyway, <laughs> uh, my, my, my listeners, I should say. So I want to turn to the next segment here because I'm cautious of time and I'm going to mm -hmm. preface this segment by saying this, this is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. I don't know how many times I get emails about this question, but I don't know. I don't know why they just don't understand understand it's an opinion not an actual yeah. motion but here we are deputy mayor wilson in your opinion as of recording this episode what do you believe are the issues or biggest issue facing the community of the town of ingersoll today well first of all i appreciate you prefacing it because every municipal councilor is always very conscious of not speaking on behalf of council. Um, so to your point, everything I've said today is just just me as Lindsay, my opinion, my experience. Yep. Uh, council may feel differently, but this has been my experience. Um, but I think, I mean, it would be impossible to answer that question without saying that housing wasn't an issue across the continuum. You know, for, from people who are living unhoused, which there certainly are in Ingersoll, all the way up to uh, seniors who may want to downsize and can't. Like it's an issue wherever you are on that spectrum. And so I don't think I can answer that question without pointing to that being like way up here. Um, but I would also say something uh, that I heard often um, and continue to hear is how a small place like Ingersoll participates in climate action because you know we we don't have um the the budget to do really large scale stuff um but i know people are concerned and i know um especially uh younger residents uh In ingersoll went through um uh like a stop the dump kind of conversation and the dump was stopped somewhat recently so that made the community very acutely aware of their impact on the environment. And so that conversation is like, okay, now what, you know? Um, so I would say those are two things that uh, I hear often. So I, I'm going to ask the semi-million dollar question here, but <laughs> the housing crisis, we're going to start there for a second. This is not a Ingersoll only issue. This is a provincial wide, if not national, if not worldwide issue right yeah. now. Um, what, what's the community, what's the council, what's the town doing right now? 
to sort of help alleviate because uh, mm -hmm. we know and you know that this is not just a municipal issue. This is all party issue. This is a federal, provincial, mm -hmm. uh, business, municipal, residential buy-in. Uh, what does the town do right now to address these issues in the short term until the long-term solution comes apparent? Yeah. Um, so we, we actually just at our last council meeting had a discussion around um, a local level housing strategy. So the staff right now will be working away at bringing something back that council can discuss. Um, so, so nothing has obviously been implemented, but the wheels are wheels are in motion to have that conversation. But I also think for me, um, you know, what I learned very quickly is that you are only one vote on council. You can care about something all day long, um, but it really does have to be uh, something you work on collaboratively. But something I can do independently is know the issue really, really well. And so that's something I've been focusing on. Like if, if you don't, I mean, there are some politicians that you can, that very clearly don't understand planning. And I'm no expert yet, for example, but I spent a lot of trying to understand planning and its impacts on housing so that when we do discuss the issue, I, I will feel like I have, important contributions to make. Um, we're also a two-tier system in Oxford County. So a lot of that um, social housing policy comes from the, um, the regional level. And that's, you know, when you want to get in there, that's, that's, a, that's tough, but we really have to have faith that, um, so that council is made up of our our mayors of each local level and, and a couple of extra representatives in the larger urban centers. Um, but there is a, a, a housing strategy at that level that, you know, will will eventually work its way down too. But the challenge- For those who want to learn more about Oxford County, they can go listen to the uh, cross-border interviews episode with Oxford County Reeve or warden, sorry, Marcus Ryan. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the hardest thing for everybody is there's not an not an overnight solution to this problem. And that's what we all want, but it's just Is there buy-in from the residents to get more housing built in Ingersoll? Or is there nimbyism alive and well? Yeah, I think it's hard because people do want more housing and they recognize that again, that is the solution across the continuum. But there's a lot of education to be had about how we get there, um, yeah. because you know how we get there might be, you know, more apartments than people are used to, for example. Um, and so some people might even say, "I'm not NIMBY, but," you know. Um, and so I don't, I don't. It's tough, but you know, it's just the education around. Like I'm trying to educate myself. This equals that. You know, residents, you know, don't necessarily you know, despite their best intentions, <laughs> have that uh, background. I want to talk about the climate action that the community is doing as well, because you said it's a, a an issue that is being raised to you uh, from residents. Uh, you know, and I know that municipalities don't have a lot of money and climate uh, greening of technology is costing a bit of money. What are you seeing in the town of Ingersoll to see sort of climate ad adaptation happening in real time? And what is the council doing or even the town doing to sort of help and uh, give a hand to uh, green technology that might be coming into your community? Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge for a small community like ours, as not just the, the money, but like other communities would have a staff with expertise dedicated to finding out what the answers are. Yeah. And so for Ingersoll, it's, you know, maybe some of the facility staff uh, educating themselves on what can be done and what funding is available. So I, I know they have been trying to figure out, you know, as we make capital improvements to buildings, if there's a green solution, you know, to consider that through the asset management. Um, we've briefly discussed again through through asset management like if there's a vehicle that needs to be replaced can it be replaced with electric versus gas so some of those things but as far as like a fulsome adaptation strategy we're not there um i would say that's maybe a, a new conversation for most of us um and uh you know there's not a fulsome strategy but some of those kind of piecemeal conversations have started 
Is there buy-in from the residents? You talk about the residents who want some climate action for the community. What are you hearing from residents about what are the, their needs and wants when it comes to climate adaptation? Because uh, I can imagine everyone has their own different opinion. And then you as deputy mayor and as a council have to take all those opinions and sort of yeah. try to figure out what the best solution is to move forward. So when you're talking, are they actually giving you input? And what are some of them that they're telling you that the town could be doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things we did do uh, somewhat early on um, was a tree planting policy. And that was something that was um, we could afford, <laughs> first of all, which is excellent. Um, and it's something that uh, like who, it's hard, like who doesn't want more trees in their neighborhood, you know, like wherever you live in in the community. And so so something like that had a lot of buy in. Um, but I think there is a, 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 you know, everybody, maybe not, but there's certainly a, a number of people who understand that either we pay for it now or we pay for it later. Like th this adaptation will come at some point. Um, and so either we, we plan ahead um, or, you know, we're forced to make that decision. Maybe not me, maybe my kids, we'll see. Um, but you know, that climate anxiety that people have, they, they, they may not know exactly what the solution is, but they expect someone to know <laughs> and someone to, you know, to take the time. So I would say that's probably where we're at. How do you, you talk about the budgetary constraints that municipalities are under as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I can imagine whether it be through direct messages, through emails, through people talking to you. Everyone has their own personal issues that they're facing in the community, whether it be potholes, parks, whether it be sidewalks, whether it be this, that, or the other. And you as a council, which are heading into a, a budget season and also just went through a budget season, have to look at all those individual issues and try to figure out who gets what they want now. Now, we know asset management is a big thing for a lot of municipalities right now, but you as municipal councillors have to sort of balance the needs and wants of your community. And sometimes some people aren't going to get what they want this year. And I preface that yeah. by saying this year. <laughs> yeah. How do you see your role as deputy mayor in addressing the needs and wants of your community with the understanding of the reality that municipalities are put under financially? Mm -hmm. I would say I spend a lot of time uh, you know, and now going into my second budget cycle, which will be a multi-year budget this time around, I will spend a lot of time engaging with residents and trying to get at um, what's most important to them. Um, and I know that sounds obvious, but, um, you know, like my social media, for example, last year, I did some, you know, engagement around the difference between a capital budget and an operating budget and, and just trying to engage people in some of the language and trying to make it more, because again, what I realized quickly is I got almost no interaction around the budget when I put the link out there and, you know, it, the opportunity for delegation, no delegations last year during the budget process, like that just blew my mind. Um, and so I realized it was probably not that people don't care. They just maybe don't have the right tools to kind of dig into that information. So how well, I, I balance I, I, it. I'm going to challenge you on that for a second. I'm going to challenge you here for a second. Okay. Did you ever present in front of council when it came to budget issues? No, prior to and, being... and that's, that's perfectly fair. Um, so how do you, and... how do you bridge that gap? How do you yeah. get people in wanting to actually give their presentation and give their opinions. Yeah. Um, I mean, this this year going around, my personal opinion, again, not opinion of council, my personal opinion is some, some people might, might need to be asked, you know, this is our budget. We're going to be spending this on this. If you have an opinion on it, we would love to hear it so we can consider it at the table. Um, some people might need that door opened for them a little bit. So they feel like that's their space, that that the council's listening and that those conversations matter. Because to your question, um, did I ever present? No, because I didn't necessarily feel like my I was represented on council. So I, I didn't feel like um, it was, you know, 
worth your what time. What I cared about would be would be reflected. Um, and I don't want people to feel like that. So there's some work to be done to change that. I want, I'm cautious of time here and I want to turn to my last mm -hmm. segment because I, I feel like we could talk about the, these issues for <laughs> like a good hour, but I am cautious of time. And I want to turn to a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is tourism. I think tourism mm -hmm. is a lost art in this community. Yeah. And I think more people should be going into the tourism sector and actually visiting great communities like uh, we have in Canada instead of going to Cancun or going to LA, which is great, but Let's let's visit some places in our own backyard first, people. Mm -hmm. So I know you're uh, a prominent uh, proponent of uh, tourism as well. What mm -hmm. are some tourist hotspots in Ingersoll that people need to see if they come to uh, the community anytime, potentially, say, next summer? Yeah. <laughs> so I think one of the really cool things that our um, tourism Oxford, so our tourism kind of happens at that, that upper level, um, they made this really cool um, uh, tour that you could do that starts at the Ingersoll Cheese Museum. So Ingersoll, like Oxford County, has a very rich uh, cheese history, which I know sounds... Uh, Easy. Um, yeah, it's unique, you know? <laughs> um, so the Cheese Museum is, is where the tour starts, and you can walk your way through a couple of, of parks and then make your way downtown and visit some uh, cheesy places uh, along the way, cheese or dairy. Um, so it's just, you know, who doesn't love cheese? Like it's it's a, a very, um, it's not very niche. There's there's something for everyone. It's family friendly. Um, My so lactose intolerant husband would disagree with that statement, oh, but okay. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, it's, it's affordable. Cause you don't, you know, you don't have to buy anything. You can just kind of take it all in. Um, but you can kind of experience the food and the history and the culture of Ingersoll through that walking tour. Um, so that's a good one. Where do you go in town? Where do you go in the community to just let it all decompress, let it all go after a long day of work, after a long day mm -hmm. of council meetings, is there a spot in the community that you can just go and you know, everything's going to be okay. Tomorrow's another day. Yeah. Um, I mean, our family spends a lot of time in the parks, of course. Um, we often go, there's one park that still has a tire swing, believe it or not. And my kids love that park. Um, and so, you know, we can do something together or I can just sit back on the bench and be compressed while they get all their energy out. Um, but if it's a big day, we take the trek to the big blue park, <laughs> which has a bigger climber and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, doing that. But Ingersoll is kind of, you know, surrounded by a lot of agriculture, of course. Um, and so that could be, you know, strawberry picking, um, you know, all kinds of amazing food here. So sometimes just making a good meal out of all the delicious things that grow here. <laughs> So it's time for the million dollar question now. And now if you've listened to the show, which you said you have, you know what the million dollar question is. And that is, in your opinion, what makes the town of Ingersoll such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, I have thought about this question too, of course. Um, I don't know if I, I, it's hard to to come up with like a, you know, a little snippet, but I really do think it is a sense of community. And I know anybody, anybody could say that and, and um, that, you know, that might be everyone's answer, but um, there does continue to be a very strong sense of community pride um, in uh, enjoying the community and, and each other's company. We have very active service clubs that you know, organize a lot of the events here still. Um, and so people do like to be out and about spending time with each other. And so that social connection and sense of belonging, you know, I recognize that's not everybody's experience. And so I'll point to that too. But but I, I like to believe that we create a sense of belonging for the people who live here, for each other. Lindsay, I want to thank you so much. 
I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to do this, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this, because I know if you have a block of time, you probably don't want to be sitting in front of a computer talking to someone from Calgary, but I appreciate it thank nonetheless, you. because I think municipalities don't get their story told as much as they should be. And I think municipal politicians need to be more prominent in our democratic institution. So thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much for serving your community. It's greatly appreciated. And I think you're doing a wonderful job serving the people of Ingersoll. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of making municipality issues matter again. Now, as we wrap up, I hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate worlds of municipal politics and municipal government from today's interview. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with this show, Cross Border Interviews, but all of our shows, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. But you're also playing an intricate role, a vital role, if that, in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission of making municipal issues prominent on a national stage, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca and clicking on that Support Us Now page. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content like today's interview you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking.